I think my screen should be up now. Um, okay, so I'm Elliot Tucker Drob. I am a professor of psychology at UT and a uh, faculty affiliate of both the Population Research Center and the Center on Aging and Population Sciences. Um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, uh, genomic structural equation modeling, which is a uh, methodological framework that I've developed with um, some close collaborators that can be used to leverage uh, genome-wide association data to uh, answer questions that I think are quite familiar uh, to uh, social and behavioral scientists. So um, before I get started, um, I just want to acknowledge my core collaborators on the development of um, uh, genomic STEM. Um, Andrew Gratzinger is a uh, PhD student here at UT who is on his uh, clinical internship now at um, uh, Harvard Medical School, and will be starting a faculty position at um, University of Colorado at Boulder in the fall. And Michelle Pivard is a, uh, uh, an assistant professor of uh, 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 psychology and uh, 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 statistical genetics at the Free University of Amsterdam. And um, everything that um, I've done on, this, on these topics has really been um, a, a team effort with both of them and many others. Um, so I'll just give a bit of an overview of what I'll talk about today. So uh, genome-wide association studies, uh, which I will describe in uh, brief in the next slide or so, uh, provide insights into the genetic architecture of medical, behavioral, and social and psychological variables. Um, the social and behavioral sciences have well de developed empirical taxonomies and models of how such variables interrelate. And so, um, what I'm proposing can be done and has, we have been doing over the past couple of years is marrying these two approaches and using this multivariate method that we call genomic STEM um, to uh, integrate uh, so, uh, the social and behavioral scientific kind of approaches to uh, multivariate data analysis with uh, uh, approaches that have been developed uh, in recent years in uh, the areas of statistical uh, genetics. So uh, for those of you who don't know what a genome-wide association study is, or for short, a GWAS, is it's a, it's a pretty straightforward um, idea. It's a series of um, univariate regressions with some control variables in which a key outcome is measured in a large group of people. And that outcome is predicted one at a time from each genetic variant. Oftentimes, this is a SNP, which stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, so an individual genetic marker. And it's done one at a time because you can't really conduct a multiple regression with millions of predictors all at once. Um, and uh, but it's done over and over again across all uh, uh, variants that have been measured across the genome. And it's hypothesis free in the sense that you're just searching for significant associations, at least that's the kind of uh, original idea behind the GWAS. And because so many associations are being tested, there's a very strict Bonferroni correction. In this case, it's five times 10 to the negative eighth power. So uh, seven zeros and then a five instead of P less than 0 0.05. Okay, so, um, so far, I think over the past, 15 or so years of GWAS, uh, what lesson have we learned? So I'd say one kind of core lesson that we've learned is that for psychological, psychiatric, and social sciences variables, not to mention medical and anthropometric variables, um, these phenotypes or traits as we call them are highly polygenic. What that means is that there's not just one or two or a dozen genetic variants that um, uh, index uh, risk, genet the genetic component of risk for these, uh, for the adverse outcomes or of uh, protection for the more beneficial outcomes, but rather there are thousands upon thousands of genetic variants that are in some way statistically associated with uh, the outcomes that have been investigated with GWAS, this, the effects of which are individually very small, but in aggregate, the effects can be uh, rather large, by at least by the standards of um, uh, observational uh, correlational research. And just to give you a sense of, of where this sort of result comes from, where this sort of 
uh, lesson that we've learned comes from. I'm going to uh, just, I'm showing right here what's referred to as the Manhattan plot for uh, schizophrenia from a big 2013 study and then a study done just uh, a few months ago. And these are called Manhattan plots because um, uh, uh, they plot the significance on the y-axis as a function of the location on the genome. In this case, it's just the first uh, 22 out of 23 of our chromosomes. And when you see an association, it should be very high because this is the significance. It's the, it's the negative log p-value. And so uh, when there are uh, a, a few large associations, you should see some skyscrapers. It should look like the Manhattan skyline. Um, on the left here is the Manhattan plot from 2013. And you can see there were a few associations. Uh, there were uh, 11 independent associations. And this was with a sample size of about 20,000 individuals. So you can see that uh, the effect sizes, because the effect sizes are small and because of the Bonferroni correction, uh, very large sample sizes are needed. But 20,000 wasn't enough. In the, more, the most recent GWAS of schizophrenia uh, with a sample size of about uh, 300,000 participants, um, there were 248 uh, skyscrapers, as we might call them on the Manhattan plot. So as power goes up, as the sample size increases, the number of variants discovered uh, increases, and we don't expect it to stop here. We would expect it to keep going. And to be able to track down each and every one of these 248 associations and understand them biologically would be a, a, a pretty substantial effort, though not impossible. But you can imagine that it, as power increases, this becomes a more and more prohibitive sort of um, task. Um, so that's for a kind of classic psychiatric disorder, which I think is conventionally viewed as um, these days as quite um, uh, uh, genetic or biological, although in the early part of the 20th century, um, mothers were blamed for their children's schizophrenia. They were called refrigerator mothers. So you can see that the um, the, the kind of uh, cultural view on what is biological has shifted quite a bit. Um, but here's one that I think is a little bit more perplexing given the outcome. This is educational attainment. It's simply number of years of um, schooling that have been completed. And what's so nice about this outcome is that although it's highly socially contextualized, it's also very easy to measure in very large samples. So um, one could argue, and it has been argued, that the um, kind of the, the fuzziness of the outcome um, is made up for by the extremely large sample sizes uh, that uh, can be obtained for this outcome. Um, and so on the left here, you can see the uh, uh, Manhattan plot for from 2013. There were three independent genetic associations on the right. And oh, and that was with 126,000 participants on the right. With 1.1 million participants, it was over 1,200 um, associations. So for, for both a psychiatric disorder and for a kind of socially contextualized outcome like educational attainment, we're seeing the same sort of story, which is that um, the outcomes are highly polygenic. Um, what's even more interesting and to some extent perplexing at face is the fact that some of the same variants that are implicated in these genome-wide association studies for quite different outcomes, um, they keep popping up. So, um, uh, for example, uh, we can take a variant which has the label RS463219. It's a variant on chromosome 18, and it was um, it's been implicated in two separate uh, completely independent genome-wide association studies in risk for schizophrenia. Um, it's a biologically plausible association in the sense that it's located um, uh, close to a gene known to be involved in uh, axonal outgrowth. Um, you would think that uh, uh, neurons have something to do with psychiatric disorders, so that would seem to make sense. Uh, the variant is, has been associated with the volume of the putamen, which is a brain region which has been linked with emotion perception, which is also known to be affected by schizophrenia. So this seems to be kind of cumulative knowledge. Um, but um, it turns out that this same genetic variant is associated with the personality trait neuroticism and uh, depression. So it's not specific to schizophrenia. And it may also even be implicated in Alzheimer's disease risk. So 
the story becomes complex in, in this kind of second way, which is that we're not studying kind of pure genetic signal for each individual outcome, but genetic signal seems to overlap. Um, a number of uh, quite sophisticated methods have been developed over the past few years to estimate the degree of overlap or the degree of genetic sharing across um, uh, uh, large sets of variables. Um, one of them, which is very commonly used, is called LD square regression, which I won't get into the technical aspects of. But the key here is that instead of cross tabulating the Bonferroni corrected hits from each GWAS, what it does is it draws on information from all of the genetic associations, regardless of their significance, in order to make a holistic um, inference about how much shared genetic signal there is across different variables. And what you can see here is a paper that I was not involved in that came out last year um, in uh, science. And uh, what you can see on the left are the genetic correlations. So this is these are in, it, it, these are ways to index the amount of genetic sharing that can be interpreted in a very similar way that you would interpret a regular correlation. Uh, so on the left is, are the genetic correlations amongst different uh, uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, represented as a heat map. And what you can see is that there is a kind of omnipresent ge genetic sharing, but not homogeneous sharing. So there is a patterning of the extent to which different disorders uh, share genetic signal, um, uh, but there is shared genetic signal across many different regions of this matrix. And on the right, you can see the genetic correlations between social and psychological um, variables and uh, 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 dis brain disorders. So psychiatric disorders and neurological disorders. And again, you can see that there's a pattern. And what's, I think, at least what pops out to me when I look at these sorts of heat maps is that the, um, the patterns are, while on the one hand, they're reducing a tremendous amount of information about millions of individual genetic associations from dozens of GWASs, they're still quite complex in and of themselves. And it would take quite a bit of kind of uh, very close inspection to start to make sense of this patterning. And so where do we go from here? Well, the social and behavioral sciences have been using multivariate methods for over hundred years now. Um, and the, the express purpose of these methods is to make sense of uh, uh, the patterning of associations amongst many different outcomes analyzed together. And so we're, what we've done in, with genomic structural equation modeling is we've borrowed this general approach developed by um, uh, social scientists for multivariate analysis. And we've, and we've developed ways to apply it to uh, uh, genome-wide association derived data. And what's particularly interesting here for, um, is that we don't need the raw data. We can just use the regression weights that are um, typically publicly uh, available from the GWASs. And we don't need knowledge of the extent to which the GWASs are um, conducted on the same or different participants in order to have unbiased estimates. So how does structural equation modeling generally and genomic SCM in this particular context um, model covariances? I'll uh, just show kind of a, a, a brief example kind of in reverse. So imagine that we knew, this is the exact opposite to what we normally would, uh, where we would normally start. Imagine that we knew the data generating model. So perhaps we knew that X caused Y with a standardized regression coefficient of 0.4 and Y caused Z at 0.6. We would be able to construct the correlation matrix that results from that. And what you would see here is that the X Y correlation would be that 0.4, the YZ correlation would be the 0.6. And we'd also know that the XZ correlation would be 0.24 because it would just be the 0.4 times the 0.6. Um, in reality, we don't know what the correlations are in the population. We just have them in the sample. So they're approximations. Um, and we don't know what the, um, the parameters are in the population model. What we can do is we can propose a model and um, estimate the parameters that optimize the fit of the model to the data that we do have. So in this case, we have 
an unknown here for the XY association, an unknown here for the YZ association. It's in the context of this directed regression model. And what we can do is we can optimize the model to the observed correlation matrix and identify the parameters that um, uh, best fit that matrix. And in this case, the parameters are 0.35 and 0.61, which are pretty close to the population parameters, but not exactly. And that's, of course, because we only have a finite sample and we don't have the real data from everyone in the world. Um, we can do this same sort of thing, not just with you know, two regression associations. We can, in fact, have many different associations and they can involve unobserved variables, such as what's represented here. So we've got variables one through five or Y1 through Y5, and we can infer or we can propose a model in which they all are correlated because there is some third or some uh, unobserved variable that hasn't been measured but influences them all. Okay, so let me just show some examples of how this sort of methodology has been applied um, to answer questions that I think quite relevant to the social sciences and really came about from uh, social scientific inquiry. So the first one that I'll talk about is a, 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 an inquiry into the genetics of what has co come to be referred to as non-cognitive skills. This is a paper that uh, really just, I think came out just last month in uh, Nature Genetics. And the kind of key overarching question that, that's being asked here is that educational attainment is a highly complex and socially contextualized outcome. I've already shown it's Manhattan plot. It's also heritable. How can that be? What explains the genetic effects on education? And if we go back to the past 30 or so years of social science research, people have asked similar questions. What individual differences beyond kind of the, um, uh, the usual suspect, which is cognitive ability, to educational attainment. So people propose perhaps it's work ethic, curiosity, uh, creativity, or uh, uh, aspects of mental health. Um, so what we did in this study is we took the genome-wide association studies for our cognitive ability and for educational attainment, and we basically subtracted out using genomic SEM the signal in educational attainment that was shared with cognitive ability. And what we were left with was um, the genetics of education that have nothing to do with cognitive ability, so a residual. And then we correlated that along with the original cognitive ability uh, GWAS with um, various external outcomes. And I think there's just a few things that are, that are interesting here. The first is people often think of, of uh, work ethic, plantfulness, and organization, which is indexed by a personality uh, uh, trait known as conscientiousness, they often think of that as kind of the key to academic success. And to some extent, this is what we see. So even though there is a negative association between conscientiousness and educational attainment, that's really masking two opposing uh, associations. The cognitive component of educational attainment is associated with less planfulness in organization, whereas the non-cognitive component is associated with more planfulness and organization. Um, schizophrenia is another example. This is, uh, we, we can look at whether or not people, the vast majority of whom do not have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, but who have genetic uh, variants that are more commonly observed with people who have, in people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, whether they go further on average in school. And what we see is that in general, in general, there's a slight kind of positive association. If you have more genetic variants in common with people who have been diagnosed with schizophrenia, you're a little bit more likely to go further in school. But again, that's masking two kind of very interestingly opposing effects. There's a, uh, a, a, a cognitive deficit associated with schizophrenia genetic risk. Whereas there's also a, uh, an, ad an advantage uh, or a propensity to go further in school, which we might expect to be um, being driven by uh, creativity and inquisitiveness, which is known to um, uh, uh, be disproportionately reflected in individuals who have relatives who have schizophrenia. Um, another example that, that I'll just give um, is uh, very briefly is an example from a study that I didn't carry out, but it used our methodology, genomic SEM. And it was struggling with um, 
a, a an interesting question, which is how various aspects of alcohol consumption uh, relate to uh, the genetics of uh, uh, social and mental health outcomes. And um, they use this questionnaire over here, which has questions about frequency of drinking, amount of alcohol drank, and then uh, more problematic behaviors. And here's a quote from the paper. What it says here is, uh, genome-wide association studies of alcohol consumption phenotypes that have consistently reported low to moderate overlap with alcohol use disorders that have surprised many researchers and even paradoxical negative associations with a variety of diseases and disorders. So I'll just call your attention in the interest of time to this um, total score on this alcohol use questionnaire and how it genetically correlates with various psychiatric disorders like schizophrenia uh, and major depression and with social outcomes like college completion. And the, the, the results are somewhat paradoxical in the sense that more alcohol uh, use is associated with going further in college and having less depression, which we know that from the perspective of alcohol use disorders is not what's found. So what these researchers did is they formally modeled the items uh, and how they relate uh, to each other genetically within this alcohol use uh, questionnaire. And they extracted two factors. Uh, the first three items tapped con uh, alcohol consumption. The remaining fact, uh, items ta tapped more problematic use. And they also found that what is here labeled as item one, which is how many times a week someone drinks, so not how much they drink in a week, but how many individual instances they drink, had particularly unique uh, or uh, what can sometimes be referred to as heterogeneous associations with the with external outcomes. And that's represented here. So the the gray bar represents the genetic correlation involving this this one item uh, related to frequency of consumption, whereas the um, uh, purple and uh, kind of light blue bars reflect the uh, scores on the general factors. And what can be seen here is that the this frequency, question was what was driving these paradoxical results from previous studies. So people who drink more frequently, but perhaps not drink very much within each instance, are indeed people who tend to have, uh, uh, to, to, ha uh, to have genetics that are associated with higher income, higher educational attainment, uh, and less depression, while at the same time, all of the other aspects of drinking which refer, uh, which include things like the amount that drank per um, per sitting, and whether or not drinking has become problematic, are indeed associated with forms of psychopathology and lower social attainment. Um, and so, um, this is just another example of how, rather than treating outcomes in uh, uh, as as kind of a a a, a, a single uh, uh, target to be investigated in if it's right, but instead uh, examining how outcomes relate to one another and whether or not patterns are heterogeneous in a kind of multivariate analysis, we can really begin to understand more nuances in the sorts of genetic associations that have been previously reported. Um, I think that's, that's where I will finish in terms of examples. Let me just um, uh, briefly conclude by saying that this is all uh, this methodology is all um, uh, based in open source software that is uh, quite flexible and uh, free to use. Uh, we provide wikis for um, people who are interested in getting involved. Um, it's uh, uh, all done through um, R. And uh, we uh, uh, have a, a fairly active Google group where we provide um, user support. So for anyone who's interested in getting involved, there's um, plenty of resources available. And of course, we're happy to speak further uh, uh, with uh, about your questions or interests. Thanks very much.